Okay. Um, right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in uh, to this evening's Association for Art History's first live digital event, which will be focusing on writing about art. This is the first in a series of uh, digital conversations and workshops that will be focusing on how to write about art from different perspectives and for different purposes. My name is Claire Davis. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive at the Association for Art History. I'm delighted to welcome Tavish Khan, who today is going to be talking about writing about art and exhibitions from the perspective of the art critic. Tavish has been visual arts editor for the Londonist since 2013 and contributes regularly to other publications and events. He will tell you more about himself shortly. So, for this evening's informal conversation, it's going to last 20 minutes, after which you will have a chance to ask Tavish questions. If you pop those questions into the chat box, we will do our best to answer those and respond possibly throughout the conversation. Um, if we don't get a chance, we might pick some of those up on Twitter afterwards. Um, please remain on mute and turn your video off. Um, we're going to record this event and make it available afterwards. Um, and I'm going to try to stick to time, stick to script. Um, and so, yeah, without further ado, hello, welcome Tabish. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit more about what you do and how you got started? Yes, well, thank you for having me, Claire. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Tabish Khan. Um, for those who want to share any of this on Twitter and Instagram, I am at London Art Critic. So Claire gave me a wonderful introduction on, into who I write for, which is for Londonists primarily. Um, so where did I start? So I started not um, in somewhere a bit unexpected. So I graduated in biomedical sciences. So I spent a lot of time dissecting dead bodies. Apologies to anyone who's eating this while they're watching this uh, talk. Um, that's where I started. And then afterwards, I didn't have a clue where I was going. And I stumbled into a career in the energy sector, which is still my primary income in terms of career wise. Uh, so the secondary career in art started when, as most people who work in a corporate job do, I was commuting on the London Underground, or those working in London. And I would look up at the adverts and you would see those adverts that say exhibition at Tate Modern, exhibition at Wallace Collection, exhibition at Welcome, a science museum. And I thought to myself, you know what, I don't really know much about art and exhibitions aside from a few visits to them as part of a school trip. And my family are not, and my wider fa friends and family aren't that or into art and exhibitions. So I thought, why not take a punt and go and see some of these? So I started going, I started thinking, it's great, it's eye-opening, it's mind-expanding, I want to see more, and it, I got a bit of a bug, and then a cousin of mine said, well, you should, you should write a blog, back when blogs were still relatively new. And so I did, and then I looked for somewhere to get it more coverage, and that's when I came across Londonist, who were... Um, largely volunteer led in terms of people who wrote for them so I joined unpaid and the irony being that Londonist today is a very professional outfit and they would have probably said no to someone as amateur as I was back then but I caught them at the right time and I've been writing for them for eight years also been writing for Fad magazine and one of the nicest things is those tube posters that started my journey now occasionally will have something like four star or five star Londonist on them, which is from one of my reviews. So it's it's really lovely to see my story come full circle. Thank you very much. That is that must be very nice actually seeing like those review those stars and comments. Well, you. You, you, yeah, if you ever see a man like who looks a bit like me taking pictures of tube posters, you'll know why. <laughs> um. So you've been an art critic now um, for a number of years. Um, do you feel that you have a different voice or a different perspective to other art critics? Um, and does that make your type and style of writing unique? Yes, well, I, I hope so. Um, I suppose I, the way to think about it is in art, there's this term that is outsider art. So outsider art is anyone who is not formally trained in art from a school or university or 
through an apprenticeship. They just come across art naturally. Uh, so I would classify myself as an outsider art critic because the way you naturally become an art critic is you either go through an art history route or a journalism route or both. And I've got neither. So, you know, I came at it very fresh. Um, and you, you do get a little bit of imposter syndrome as something that most of us experience at some point in our lives. In our lives. So, yeah, it was strange for me doing that. But then I also think that by having one foot outside of the art world and one foot inside it, I've got that slightly different perspective where I can be looking at it from the outside in. And that's why there's um, the joke amongst my colleagues at Londonist, um, and it's now spread a bit more, is to refer to me as the people's art critic for that very reason, in that I am seeing many more shows than the average person, but I'm still one of the average person rather than one of the, I don't know, the art establishment. Uh, so that, I think, um, ensures that I write in a very, I wouldn't say a populist style, but very much in an accessible style. So, because, you know, I'm, if you ask me who I'm writing for, I am kind of writing for, for want of a better word, the Tabish Khan in waiting, that other person who hasn't discovered art just yet. And I'm hoping that by reading what I have to say, that they will suddenly decide, oh, maybe I want to take a chance on art and go see some exhibitions. Um, that I think that term, the people's art critic, is such a such a great. You must feel so flattered to have that kind of reputation that's now kind of going outside of your own Londonist office. Yes, well, I, I should point out all art critics. To be an art critic, you have to have somewhat of an ego. And it's always nice to be referred to the people's art critic, even if it does sound a little bit socialist. Um, I don't know, I think. Um, so I suppose uh, you... So how, how, how does writing about exhibitions, do you think, sort of differ from other forms of writing about art? Um, I mean, you sort of touched upon it before, like, for instance, do you have a type of reader or audience in mind when, when, you, when you write? Yeah, like, like I said, um, I would love for people within the art establishment to read what I write, but I'm also writing for those people who aren't, you know, so au fait with it. And, you know, I think there's a problem with art in the sense that if you look at the arts, as in art forms generally, so I'm including things like film, theatre, uh, dance, opera, visual art. Visual art actually has the lowest barriers to it because there's usually a lot of visual art everywhere in most cities and towns. A lot of the time it's free, right? So given that it's free and there's not many barriers to it, it still doesn't have the level of visitors that you, you get for another medium, say cinema. And cinema, you always have to pay for cinema, with a few exceptions. And yet, there's something like over 70% of adults will have visited uh, a cinema theatre in the last year or so, um, COVID accepted, of course. And art, it's about 50%. And for minorities, it's even lower than 50%. So I think amongst Asian, um, it's about 40%. And amongst Black, it's 33%. So I'm hoping also to draw in those kind of people who wouldn't be normally attracted to art. And it's, it's not just an ethnicity thing as well. It's very much middle class pursuit is seen as art. And there's a lot of not working class people going to exhibitions. So I'm hoping that by writing about art in an accessible way that relates it to the every person in the street that they will then visit. Yeah, I think access. I think it's very strange with art, particularly like what you just said. It's so uh, you should be able to just walk into a museum or gallery, but there's somehow that kind of barrier, mm. um, which is um, yeah. Uh, so um, I'm going to try to keep to, to script so we don't run over. Um, so at the moment. You, you write for online content, um, mainly on the con online content only. Do you think that there's a difference between writing 
for online and writing for, for print? Yes, I do think there's a difference. I think there's a difference in audience. It tends to skew younger when you're going online versus print. But I also think there's a lot more things vying for your attention. So, you know, when you, when you read something in a newspaper, you don't have flashing adverts next to you or things trying to click to you. Or if you're looking at your phone, you don't have notifications pop up, which you do on a phone. And people tend to actually skim a lot more online. I've noticed that myself. If I'm reading an article that has a reading length of maybe four to five minutes or more, I'll find myself sometimes skimming if it doesn't grip me. Um, and probably something I shouldn't admit, but even for fellow critics who I admire, I might skim through their reading as well. Uh, but I think there's also a sense of that's not necessarily the case. I think as long as people know what they're getting in for, I mean, one of the things that I quite like about online is a lot of longer reads have now started putting um, a time at the top to tell you how long it would take you to read this article. And, and with that sort of signal, I found that even for really lengthy reads, I mean, I was mentioning to Claire as we were preparing for this talk, but there's an article I read, I think, I believe it was in the New York Times. Um, it's nothing to do with art. It's called Deliverance at 27,000 feet. And um, it's about people who climb and die on Everest and what happens to those bodies and how they're recovered. A rather a carb subject, probably harking back to my biomedical days, but that's a 60 minute read, which is a very, very long article. I mean, that's almost like a novella in itself. And I was gripped for 60 minutes reading that on my phone. So I think with the right writing and the right signals, I think, it doesn't have to be all about skimming on lines, but for my writing, I tend to keep it to about four or 500 words for reviewing an exhibition because that seems to be roughly the attention span. Um, and it's always quite hard to write shorter than longer, I feel like. It's easy to, quite, to write lengthy prose about the big exhibition because I could go on forever, but to keep it short, you have to really think about what does the reader want to see. Yeah, I think that, that always writing um, short text, short copy is a lot harder and trying to get people straight in and like you said, engage them and then keep them, obviously not for 60 minutes, but you know. Um, so I guess sort of with that, with that in mind, um, when, so when we read uh, a tabish review, um, you know, five stars, um, how do we know that you've actually been to the exhibition? So how do you write about the exhibition and the works? Um, like, what's your approach? Mm. Well, it's funny that you say that because I remember someone ages ago when I first started writing uh, made some comment that they didn't think I'd been to the exhibition. And I, I was kind of shocked and a little bit offended, actually, but I didn't realise that that's actually a common thing, that sometimes you will read articles from people who haven't been to see the exhibition. Uh, so I always go to see the things that I write about, unless I'm previewing, obviously. Um, but when I do go, it's that sense of, you know, people want to know what you felt and thought. What is your overarching feeling or thought about this exhibition? That is the main chunk of a review. I mean, listing out reams and reams of all the works on display, I mean, that's what the, that's what the exhibition catalog is there for. You know, that's not what people want to know. They want to know, how does this exhibition make you feel? And even if they disagree with your end opinion, there almost has to be enough there that they can say, actually, Tabish gave this a one star, but I disagree with him. I think I'm going to go see it because what he's told me appeals to me. And I think that's, that's what you want to capture, that even the people who disagree with you will still find enough to go see. And like I was saying earlier, getting that down to four or 500 words is actually not an easy task. Um, no, I don't imagine that's an easy task at all. Um, and actually, it's, it's really interesting you say that it's, it's the feelings, because sometimes like, if I read a review, sometimes I almost feel um, compelled, you know, if it's that bad, I almost feel compelled to go, because it's like, how, God, it's sort of almost like a challenge. Yeah, well, I, I said that to my um, editor once, which is that, my one star reviews will drive far more people to an exhibition than my three stars. Because people think three stars, eh, it's on the fence, but one star, I mean, why is this person so upset? Um, and 
And also that thing about art is the difficulty is also it's pure, pure, almost purely subjective. Like if you're reviewing something like film or dance or opera, there are certain standards and they're quite, you know, quite neatly boxed in to some degree as to what you can do with those mediums, while art is all over the place. So there is a lot of subjectivity and that's why some people I've spoken to would feel more comfortable reviewing film than they would art because with art they think well where do I start and I think that's why that what you feel matters more because there is that 100% subjectivity and that also means is the uh, it's the reason why you find that critics will generally not always agree on art while they would on something like film because there's such a level of um, subjectivity to it. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to go slightly off script now, but it's, so I'm interested, I'll go back on the script. Fine. Um, so what would make you, because um, now I'm obviously interested in your one stars, um, naturally, what would make you, uh, what has made you in the past sort of give something a, a one star? I mean, a few things that I've given one stars to is, like, is generally not just, not that I think that the quality of the art per se is poor, so that might be part of it. It's more the sense that it's what sometimes referred to art for art's sake, this kind of art that's been made that only if you're an art insider are you going to, quote, get it. You know, and I don't like that. The fact that, oh, well, you know, if somebody who studied this artist's work for years comes up, they'll or immediately, they'll, they'll strike a chord, they know how to engage with it, done. What I want exhibitions to be is that if someone who doesn't know anything about this artist walks in, they can get to grips with it. And that doesn't mean that art has to be dumbed down or simplified. You know, art, art can be complex, but you need to, you know, you need to let people into it. You know, you need to give them an access point. You know, if you think about things like, I mean, the people I often cite are new scientists who are in magazines who are designed for the average person who's interested in science. They're dealing with very complex things like quantum physics, for example, and they try, they don't always succeed, but they try and write it in a way that slowly gets you into it. Yes, you'll have to reread a few pages, but you'll get there with enough effort. Well, there's a lot of art exhibitions I've been to. Um, the one that I always cite is the one called Conceptual Art in Britain at Tate Britain, where uh, the wall text was covered with what's often known as art speak or international art English. And that just confuses people and puts people off. You know, I put myself in that position of, let's say I was someone who hasn't been to an exhibition. And I thought, you know, conceptual art in Britain. I don't know a lot about conceptual art. Maybe I'll pay the ticket price to go see it. And then if you wander in and all you're um, confronted with is lots of texts about, you know, using words like didactic and liminality and ontological, I think the first thing you're going to think is, oh, well, that was a mistake on my part because this is not designed for me. And that really shouldn't happen. You know, nobody should feel that, you know, it's okay for people to engage with art and say, you know what, I understand it, but I don't like it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You know, it's perfectly acceptable. But I don't like it when they've got some blockers that mean you just can't even get to that point and you just walk away frustrated. Um, yeah, I, I, we've, I know you and I have spoken quite a lot about some of these, some of these things. And, and I suppose it, it sort of uh, links with the next question around, you know, sort of pet hates, um, things that you, that you never do in, you, in your writing. Um, because I suppose, you know, accessibility, that, that sense, accessibility and that sense that, yeah, it's okay for you to be here. You know, you're welcome. Um, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also think about things such as, you know, I talked about inclusivity earlier and, and you, I've seen it so many times, you know, I mean, I've been to private views, which are, you know, the, the opening of exhibitions. I mean, my first point I should point out is I've got to hang up with the word private view. If there's not a guest list, it's not private. Don't call it that because it just tells people that I don't belong there who aren't familiar with the, how the art world works and all its trappings. Um, but I've been to, say, exhibitions at, off Brick Lane. Now, Brick Lane, for those 
who will be familiar, who are familiar, is the heart of the Bangladeshi community in London. Um, and you go to these exhibition openings and it's all white middle class folk. And you think, well, how can that possibly be when 50 meters away, there are loads of Bangladeshi people hanging about, but none of them are in this gallery. And same with Brixton, you know, Brixton is very multicultural. And likewise, I'll go to a gallery opening and it's all middle class white folk, which is, you know, it shouldn't really be that way. No, I, I, it, it should not be that way. I think that's uh, something that everyone can agree on. Um, so, uh, we're doing pretty well time-wise. Um, and we've, um, I've noticed that there's three, three comments so far. Um, so, um, how has your writing um, changed over the course um, of your art critic career? Mm, well, I, I hope first and foremost that it's got better. You know, that's what I'd hope. Um, and hopefully my, I've learned a lot from editors. You know, I've had editors who are, as for want of a better word, proper journalists. Uh, they've taught me certain things and that's helped. And you know what, there, there was a, I talked about imposter syndrome, um, say 10 minutes ago. And that's another thing that came out, which was that when I started writing, I was thinking, you know, let's look at the people who are getting published a lot. So you had like the late now Brian Saul, people like Adrian Sir who writes for The Guardian, Vladimir Janschak who writes for The Times, some of the biggest names in art writing. I always pictured like, well, how can they be like more like them? Because obviously they're successful. And then it took a while for me to get to a level of confidence where I think actually, you know, the world doesn't need another Adrian so It's got him, you know? What it needs is another, it needs is a tabish calm. But what does that mean? You know, how do I find my own voice? So, you know, it's fun experimenting with things. I try to, you know, put humor in them. People don't like it in the art world, but you know what? The art world's stuffy and deserves to be, have its feathers ruffled occasionally. And also, you know, some, sometimes try and be more creative. One of my editors still thinks her, my best piece, according to her opinion, is there was a V&A exhibition about Winnie the Pooh. So it was about Winnie the Pooh and the stories. And my review was written in the style of a Winnie the Pooh story in which P uh, Piglet and Pooh go to the V&A to see an exhibition about themselves. And she loved it and she thought, and it got a lot of reach and you know, that sort of creativity and experimentation doesn't always pay off, but it's always good to try. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, again, it goes back to just that, that sense of being human. Like, you know, yeah. this is a human experience. And, and I think if you're, you know, you're a human being talking about an experience you've had and, and the feelings and thoughts that you've had, um, and that, that is what's going to connect it, in your writing. Um, with people reading it because they're humans as well. Um, so I'm going to um, end with this question um, and then we can um, see if there's, there's questions from, from the audience. Um, do, what would be your sort of top three tips for writing, um, writing about art for aspiring art critics um, and writers? Yeah, so I think, I mean, they're not going to be anything spectacularly new, but hopefully um, what you're expecting. So number one is write as much as you can, you know, only through writing more and more do you actually get to the point of learning what works and take, you know, experiment a little bit, try different things. It doesn't always pay off or, you know, it doesn't just because something is poorly received doesn't mean it's poorly written. It could just be a different audience that maybe it's not reaching. Um, and obviously now today with everyone having easy access to a blog, that's a lot easier to do. And, you know, don't be scared of publishing things. You might get some negative feedback that happens, but that's just par for the course. Um, so just get comfortable with that. Um, second thing I would say is get comfortable with all the things that sit around writing. Because more and more, I mean, I'm an example of writing, not paying my bills. You know, there's less and less money in writing, which is upsetting, but that's the nature of it. So just get familiar to, with all the things such as social media and how to make the most out of it and share your writing, how to make the most out of having your own website, um, how to get comfortable with other things that sit around writing. So hosting panel discussions, hosting talks like this, you know, doing talks. I mean, it, it takes a while, you know, I mean, I used to be very unfamiliar with talks unless 
confidence and more conscious of how I was behaving on screen. And now I've got more used to it. Um, and even in lockdown, I'm having to learn things like always look at the camera because that's where you make eye contact. Don't look at the screen. The things like that, you know, you learn as you go along. And the final one I would say is not all the best writing is in art, right? Look wider, read widely, read as many articles as you can. You know, what works in say, writing about social history, what works in writing about food. And if you get a chance, do try and write about other things. You know, I have written about food and theater, which is opportunity Londonist has given me. And you know, that kind of opens your eyes. and. And I've also written about wider things. I mean, I mean, we were talking about negative feedback. I mean, the most negative feedback I got was um, I wrote a piece called Why Uber is the Best Thing for Black Cabs. And that angered a lot of black cabbies on Twitter who came after me. Uh, but that was entertaining anyway. Uh, but yeah, those are my three tips. To kind of write as much as you can, get comfortable with all the other things that sit around writing, such as social media, and try writing and reading about things wider than art. Thank you. I would probably add to that as well. I've learned something from you saying, look at the screen, look at the camera, not the screen, which I've been doing probably a lot. And also get a vanity lamp because now I've gone very dark. Um, <laughs> so, um, thank you. Right. I'm going to see if I can scroll through some of these uh, comments and questions. Um, so there's one here from Meg. Um, why do you choose or apply a rating? What do you believe the rating does for you and the reader? Yes, so that's an interesting one. So uh, thanks for that question, Meg. So Londonists didn't used to have ratings and I didn't write with ratings. Um, and then we changed to have ratings. And I think it's a contentious one because some people feel that your the thing that I mentioned about tube posters, you don't appear on tube posters unless you apply a rating. So therefore you should. Uh, but I think it also helps in the sense of people know what they're um, what they're getting out of it, you know, in the sense that, you know, it, even from re reading someone's writing, it's actually quite hard sometimes to determine um, what is what the person actually thought of it. And the rating does help if you just want a one liner of like, is this person saying I should go to it or not? Because I've read reviews and not known what they were talking about. So that helps in that sense, but you're, there is that constant tussle about whether we should or shouldn't, and we do. But elsewhere I've written, they don't, so it varies from publication to publication. But it's more an editor's decision rather than my own. So we do, I mean, uh, editors and I have had quite a few back and forths on ratings. Uh, we like, Tab, that doesn't read like a four star, you give it four, it reads like a three. And then we'll go back and forth and discuss. They'll never change it without my permission, but we'll have spirited discussions and then land on the correct star rating. Well, whatever star rating we land on. Um, okay, so we've got one here from Jessica. Um, Tavish, do you have any tips or advice for artists writing about their own work? Yeah, thanks Jess. Um, on that side, I would say that, you know, there is, I mean, you know, writing is a skill. So sometimes there is a benefit, but you as an artist need to weigh this up personally around whether it's worth asking someone to write and pay them for it. You know, obviously you've got to think about the costs and whether it's worth it for yourself as an artist, but you know, sometimes that helps. And if you're not doing that, if you're writing yourself, I would say also, you know, try and keep it short and sharp, try and keep it, um, avoid the art speak if you can. Um, also get other people to look at things because, you know, as a, as an artist, you're invested in your work in a way that someone who is coming to it cold won't be. So often it's helpful to ask others to look at it. So for example, one thing I've said to artists is when you've got your website and you've got the big splash image, which is the main header image or the hero image, sometimes known, you know, don't be the person who chooses that image. Because you as an artist have a different investment in different works. You might think, I worked three years on that work and therefore it matters more to me. But that might not be what grips people when they land on the website. So find a trusted friend um, who can tell you, or loved one, who can tell you that's how you do it. Or yeah, feel free, always get more and more feedback from other people if you can. Okay, here's... Um... 
another one here uh, from KS. Um, what resources do you turn to most when you're writing about art? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one. Now, thanks to the internet, we've got more resources at our fingertips than ever. I'm not saying it's always the greatest of resources, but we have it. Um, so I always try and do a little bit of researching on the artist before I go. But then I also feel that, I mean, that's sort of two minds about the more I know about an artist, the more I can educate the reader, if that's what I'm looking to do. But at the same time, I also want to come at it cold to avoid that mistake that I mentioned last time, which is you... <laughs> you go in assuming so much about the artist that you have a different experience that the average person would have. Now, I appreciate the more and more time I spend in art, that's always gonna to start to separate the art and holding onto that will always be a juggling act. So that's what I try and do. I try not to read other people's reviews because I don't want that coloring my review before I write it. I might read it afterwards. Um, but because I'm writing short and snappy, reviews I tend not to need to access too much historical resource even if I might do that afterwards for my own interest I might not do it for a, a review thank you um we've got quite a lot of questions so I don't know how long you want to kind of um respond to questions for and how long people are sort of happy to sort of hang out for but um I'm happy to sort of keep this open yeah, and, and, and chatting um, I'm also going to see if I can find, um, I think some of the questions are sort of quite long and um, might require a bit more sort of feedback. But um, here's one from Lucy um, who says, what is your opinion about the reduction in time and money for many schools across the country for art? Would you have liked to have studied art history or art at school yourself? Yeah, I mean, do you know what? It's, it's an interesting because I've never actually gone back and studied art history. Maybe I should. Um, maybe I'll have to learn something myself. I probably will learn a lot, actually. Um, think about school. And I think, I think that's tricky about schools and art because they are cutting a lot of money for arts. And I think there is this view that art is not a, a sort of an economic powerhouse, which a lot of re reports have done by smarter people than I have disproved. And, you know, how much the money the museums bring in and and so forth, um, and not just visual art, wider arts. Uh, in terms of art history, so it's really interesting art history because as you guys know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I didn't know anything about art until I was well into my 20s, right? And so if you had asked me before that, what is art history? I'd have probably said, you know what? I only know it as that subject that tops study at private school. You know, didn't Prince William do art history? You know, you think about art history being this thing that only, you know, only people only study art history if they're also studying classics, as it were. You know, it's that kind of thing. And that's quite sad that it's seen as this sort of elevated thing, you know. You know, you need to know Latin to study art history or something. You know, it's, it's not. But I think that is quite sad that it's only seen at those schools. Um, and I don't know, I mean, you know what, I'm not an expert in education, so I can't really talk about how you bring that into more sort of comprehensive schools. Uh, but I'm sure there are smarter people than I who can answer that question, but, or maybe Claire can answer that question. She knows more about art history than I do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, we, I'm going to plug one of, there, there's a new online art history A level that people can sign up to do if, if they really want to, um, which, which we've done, but, uh, no, I mean, actually art history doesn't just exist in those those schools but I think that that's the kind of ongoing sort of perception of it and I think that's why like the Association for Art History is very much about kind of broad inclusive art history um, and trying to sort of you know show that demonstrate that kind of champion that work towards sort of um, policies and, and, and activities that actually show and, and support that breadth um, so um, so here's um, a question from uh, Krista. Um, Hello, I wonder about the practical aspects of getting those first pieces uh, published. Um, how a review that you write actually ends up in publication if, if you're like a new or aspiring writer. I mean, obviously you, you had a kind of lucky break at the right time in the right place with, with Londonist, but if other people are kind of looking sort of do that now 
uh, do you have any suggestions or comments? Yeah, I think, I mean, so this is the bit where I probably get a little bit contentious because people, there's a lot of people in journalism who will tell me that you should never, you should never write for free, right? You should always, you should always get paid for your writing. And unfortunately, I mean, as you can see, case in point with me, sometimes the entry point is writing for someone who isn't paying. I know that's unfortunate, but that's often, you know, if you can find someone like a proto-Londonist, someone who is in the space that Londonist was back then, relying on volunteers to write, um, there usually are a few about, and you have to do your research and look at who's writing about art. Um, you know, Google is your friend there. Then that might be a way in. I think the only thing I would always say about writing for free is that if you have to do it and if you can afford to do it, it's just make sure that the balance is right so that you're getting the experience and the exposure that you want out of it um, in exchange rather than monetary value. So for example, don't feel like you have to keep writing for free about things that you don't want to write about because you know, some people easily get sucked into that vortex and that's something that should be avoided. So yeah, some, often, unfortunately, that is the way in for writing, but you know, there's no harm obviously writing for yourself to the point where people could see your writing and then maybe pitch to someone who does pay. I mean, that's another avenue where you're writing for free, but for yourself to start with before you go to bigger and better things. Thank you. Um, I think, so we've got, we might do one more question and then what we might do is then pick up on some of the longer ones on, on Twitter, because I can't read the longer ones. Yeah. Um, do you want to share the Twitter handle, Claire? Yeah, I will do. So if I ask you one more question, which is quite a nice question to end on. Um, <laughs> and uh, oh, where did it go? Um, uh, hang on. Here you go. Right. Tabish, if you could write a review about any artist's work in a theoretical exhibition, what would that be and why? Do you know what? I saw this come up and I thought, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Genuinely haven't got a clue where to start with that. Because the thing is that wanting to see a work is different from wanting to review a work. Because, you know, what makes something exciting to review is not necessarily what makes it exciting to see. So, for example, as much as I love works by old masters, they're not actually that interesting to write a review about because a lot has already been written about them. So actually writing reviews about contemporary work is more interesting for me because it is kind of you don't come in with any preconceived notions right even if you decided to turn your mind blank and went to see a show that featured work by Michelangelo you can't come in without preconceived notion because you know how revered he is but with contemporary artists you almost have this view that you know you are coming at it completely cold so I might ex describe a few shows that I thought were interesting and if something could look a bit like those, then maybe that would be what I'm after. I mean, I mean, this is a show that was maligned by a lot of people, but I liked it, so I wouldn't put it out there. It was, um, there was a show um, called The Invisible Show at the Hayward Gallery, uh, where all of the work was invisible. Um, and so all the concepts were really grand, and I quite enjoyed writing about it in a sense that, so for example, one of the works was a plinth, which had nothing on it, but the artist had had a witch doctor from Africa hex the space above the plinth. And I just love the idea that, I know I don't, I'm a rational scientist person, I don't believe in hexes, and I don't believe in curses, but I'm not gonna put my hand over that plinth. And someone else who was in the exhibition did, and I did say to her, I'm like, if you step out that door and you get hit by a bus, then you've got no one to blame but yourself right <laughs> so that sort of thing that really stimulates your mind but it's very hard to visualize makes for an interesting review because how do you review and write about something that's hard to explain and hard to see um so maybe that's that's a bit of a cop out but that's my answer now that's a really good answer that's not a cop out um, <laughs> no. um right i'm gonna yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind things up now and I'm going to um, just uh, say thank you very much, Tabish. Um, it's been 
as ever, hugely enjoyable, um, hugely inspiring. Um, and uh, yeah, we will, we will try and follow up some of these questions on, on Twitter. Um, and you can uh, find Tavish um, at the uh, at London Art Critic. Um, and you can find uh, us, the association, at All Art History. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it just, um, I can, I did mean to put something up, but I've lost my screen share. Um, so um, thank you very much, everybody, um, for attending this evening. Um, and yeah, we'll pick us up on Twitter and hope to see you at another Writing About Art event soon. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for listening and watching. Yeah, enjoy your evening. Bye.